We're going to get the ball rolling. As the title of, of, ton- of tonight's lecture, it's not, not really a lecture, it's, it's questions and answers. You know, we had about four months ago, for those of you that were here, we had Rabbi Shachar here before, and it was a beautiful lecture. But unfortunately, when we hit the questions and answers part, which was uh, towards the end, there was a lot of people that had questions. It was very late, and it, you know, so there was all that energy, and it didn't, uh, we couldn't accommodate for everybody. So we figured this time, instead of the lecture, we'll cut the lecture, and we'll go straight to the questions and answers. So that's what it's going to be. We're going to do questions and answers. I, we have a list made up. We had the guys that sent in in advance questions, so we have, we're going to start with those. If during the time that Rabbi, Rabbi Shachar is answering a question, something comes to your mind, please, that's what the pens and papers are for, write out a paper, I'll, I'll pass it up. What we have tonight, it was very nice of Rachman and Cohen, he's going to be the mediator. Okay, so I, I'll pass all the questions on to him, he's going to be the one to, uh, to control the flow of questions, let's just say. And, um, you know, we'll try to accommodate everybody. Hopefully we'll, we'll get down to the issues that everyone is looking to address. And if there's something that you feel like wasn't addressed, that you don't, you know, you don't feel like you're getting it from the paper, towards the end, later, Mitzvah Shem, when the official part ends, you know, feel free to hold on to that question. You could approach Rabbi Shafat and speak about it individually. Well, I wasn't here at the uh, at the last gathering, but listening to the audio, it seemed like a lot of the discussion had to do with with what is what is knowing in God, and what and what is to belief in God. Are they the same, and are they different? So I figured I figured we'll start off we'll start off in that topic tonight. And um, these questions, most of these questions were submitted earlier, but you know, feel free to send anything up. Anyway, so the first question was that was sent in is, is there a difference between knowing God and believing in God? And if there is, how does one come to know or believe in in God? Since there's a lot of questions that run, you know, the gamut of different things, not all focused just on this, we'll try to, you know, especially since we spent a long time discussing this last time, we'll try to, you know, to pace it. Let's not get stuck just on... uh, In plain English, you want to give short answers. (laughs) <laughs> instead of mini lectures. <clears throat> the difference between knowing God and believing in God. Um, of course there is. Uh, believing in God means you have simply accepted something by tradition. Um, you were raised that way, you were taught that way, and therefore you, from childhood, you did not know any different. And things that have really been ingrained, or call it brainwashed, uh, into you are hard to get rid of. Knowing is something that you are proactive in, that you participate, that you search, that you ask, uh, that you try to find out and get to know about it as much as possible. Um, As we discussed last time, Rambam... Um, in his code in the Mishnah Torah begins the very first paragraph by saying that Yesaita uh, Yesaita is from the Chochmas, the foundation of all foundations, the pillar of all wisdom is Leida Shiyash Shomotsu Rishayim to know that there is this first being that brought everything else into being and he regards that as a mitzvah uh, the mitzvah as a matter of fact which he says is the very first of the Ten Commandments so Mechia Shem First of Ten Commandments, the way we have in our tradition, I am Hashem your God, who has taken you out from the land of Egypt. Um, offhand doesn't say anything. Um, it's simply God introducing himself. Hi guys, it's me. You know, just took you out from Egypt, remember? A few weeks ago. And uh, here I am again. And here I am giving you the Torah. Uh, so it's not really a commandment. And yet for us, this is a God as the first of Ten Commandments. So what does it signify? And according to our tradition, it signifies the mitzvah to get to know about God as much as is humanly possible. We can never really know God. God is infinite, we are finite. Uh, But we can certainly come to recognize our own knowledge 
by a process of induction, deduction, the same as you come to certain conclusions and to certain knowledge about certain realities from your experience and from your anal- an analysis of what things are. So that way we have an obligation to try and search out. Belief and knowledge are two different things. There's a teaching of the Baal Shem Tov, which he says, belief and knowledge, a muno and yetio, each has an advantage, each has a disadvantage. The advantage of yetio, of knowing something, is that when you know something, it becomes a living reality to you. You know what you're talking about. You know what you're involved in. You know what you're doing. So when you do a mitzvah, you learn Torah and so forth, you know exactly what this means, the Torah, or I in Kuchu Bichuchato, Torah in God are one, and by learning Torah, I get to know God's will, God's wisdom, uh, as it were, God's mind. Uh, it's an attachment with God. Um, and likewise, in doing the mitzvahs, knowing that this comes from God, and God is the creator of everything, and God has... Uh, certain reasons why he commands us certain things, so therefore obviously I'm involved in a very important uh, engagement, whatever it is. And therefore every mitzvah that you do, and uh, it becomes a living reality. You appreciate what it is because you know more or less what it is about. That's the advantage of idea. As opposed to a muno, that's the disadvantage of a muno, for a person who has only faith, uh, when he does something, he does it so simply because that's the way he has been trained. That's the way he has been raised. Uh, he doesn't know any different. He's scared to do anything different. Um, he goes through the motions. In effect, he is like a robot. Um, it's not a living reality. You do so either out of fear, uh, fear of punishment, fear of uh, winding up at a barbecue, um, or you do so because you look f- anticipate going to the big ball up in heaven. Um, but that's simply... You're going through the motions. So the advantage of Yediyo is the disadvantage of Emunah. On the other hand, Yediyo knowledge has a disadvantage, has a problem. Namely, in so far that you rely on your reason, you rely on your intellect, you rely on your intelligence. Uh, so whatever makes sense to you, you will adopt, you will follow. And whatever doesn't make sense, you put it aside. Uh, we, we can be very smart lots of smart people in this world uh, but for every smart person there is always another person who may have 1% higher IQ than you have and he may possibly come up with a good question for which you presently may not have an answer it's very easy to question and uh, if you do not have an answer then technically for you to be consistent for you to be honest you would have to say well okay he, he caught me I'm caught in a bind I have no answer to this. And since I have no answer to this, so therefore I have to drop it. Because otherwise you're no longer following intelligence. Otherwise you move back to faith. So that is a danger there uh, then if a person relies strictly on intelligence and on intellect. And this disadvantage of Yediyo becomes the advantage of a Muno. If somebody has a Muno, you can come with all the questions in the world, you can come with all the problems, you can, with all the refutations, the person who has faith, he shrugs it off. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't understand these things. I'm not interested to understand it. I just know that what I believe in, that is the truth, that is real. And uh, there's nothing further to the question, which means nothing can shake the person of faith. So the advantage of the one becomes a disadvantage of the other, and the advantage of the other becomes a disadvantage of this. The ideal is to take both horns, uh, to take both of them. The foundation obviously has to be of faith in anything. Anything in life is based on faith. The scientist starts off with faith. The philosopher starts off with faith. The basic premises that you accept, on which you build your whole philosophical castle, the basic premises on which you build your whole scientific castle, uh, even take, for example, um, sense perception, the five senses, on which we base pretty much all our experiences, on the base of which we make all our judgments, that's an act of faith. Because technically speaking, strictly speaking, you can't trust any of your senses. Uh, seeing is believing, people say. But seeing, we all know, all of you have had optical illusions. And if you didn't have them, I can g- get you some optical illusions right here and now. You, you know yourself, you, uh, there are certain things where we have these. Which means your eyes sometimes lie. 
if they lie some of the time, and the other time they tell the truth, how will you know when they're telling the truth and when they're lying? Likewise with hearing, likewise with tasting things, likewise with just about anything. So therefore, we, but we still assume that our sense perception, without which you cannot do or relate to anything, um, generally, basically, do convey a picture of reality. But that's an act of faith. Uh, so, and so likewise, with all the so-called scientific axioms, or logical axioms, uh, they're all things which we kind of we take for granted. We claim that they are self-evident. So there's an element of faith in everything that we do. But then, moving from there further, you try to build and uh, construct uh, with give and take, with induction, deduction, uh, logical conclusions, etc., etc. So as the, the old saying goes, for the believer, there are no questions. For the skeptic, there are no answers. If somebody wants to be skeptical, regardless of what answer you give him, he will always find some way that he will show that this answer doesn't really satisfy me. And for the believer, he doesn't care about the questions. Uh, so there's a bit of a tug of war there. The ideal is, yes, we have to start with faith. So let's start with faith in something that is reasonable. And then once we have, for that matter, without starting with faith, you have really nothing to build on on your knowledge. If you start us off with skepticism, then regardless of what arguments, regardless of what proofs are going to be given to you, you're never, you're never really going to be happy with them. So we have to join and combine these two together. The initial act in upbringing is faith, like it was any children. Children, when they are raised, uh, know, have their knowledge and their awareness of whatever they see as reality or whatever they are taught is good or bad, right or wrong, it's on the basis of what they have been told. Then later they build on that, they can revise it. We all revise it. You have been taught by your parents and by your teachers many things. Um, and when you were young, your conscience would bother you if you violated these things. Uh, but later on, as you grow older, you kind of revised it. You reprogrammed your computer. And as you reprogram your computer, things that you once felt bad about, you no longer feel bad about. Things that you once did not feel bad about, you do feel bad about. Uh, it works in, in both ways. Uh, which, uh, incidentally, is people use very often an answer to many questions about to excuse their behavior. He says, I follow my conscience. I follow conscience is the biggest cop-out that you can imagine. Because there is such a wonderful thing which is called conscience. I think we touched upon that last time as well. Um, you're born with a conscience, but all that you're born with is just the principle of there is such a thing as right and wrong. There's no way we can explain where we get the concept of right, wrong, good, bad, from. That's something that's inborn unless you're a psychopath. And psychopaths, you know, you have to lock them up to protect them against themselves and to protect society against them. So you are inborn with that. But you're not inborn with the knowledge of what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad. That is information that is fed into you and programmed into you uh, by your parents, by your teachers, by society around you. But, as I said before, this is not something that you are really stuck with. This is something in which you very often sit in judgment over and reprogram yourself. Um, so, initial education unavoidably has to be of faith. When you went to go to school, not just in religious matters, also in secular matters, mathematics, uh, literature, uh, reading, writing, whatever it is, like the famous story in the Gemara, uh, that uh, a Gentile once came to Hillel, and he says, teach him the whole Torah, and then he started teaching him, but then he started questioning him, um, taught him olive base, etc., and then he started questioning him, but how do you know that this is true? So, then he says, okay, let me teach you. And before he taught him comets olive or uh, comets base bo, and now he started teaching him comets olive e, comets base boo, turning everything upside down. So he said, before you taught me different, what's going on? He says, and who says that the way I taught you before is the correct way? So if you accept a certain form of education on which you base everything, uh, that that is the way it is, then you have to take it consistently from there. So initial education is an act of faith. But thereafter, you also have an obligation, since you are a human being, you have intelligence, you have a mind, that's what separates you from everything else, uh, that you have to examine and investigate, not by rejecting, 
not by becoming skeptical, 